this guy comes riding in from the West and he said, and they said, you got to raise taxes. We got to get more money in the treasury because everything is going south. And you know what he said? He said, well, I think that uh, we ought to cut taxes, mm -hmm. give people and business more disposable income to invest, and that ought to spur economic growth. And you know what? He was right. We had 25 years of economic expansion, or 20-some years of economic expansion. And this philosophy that you can spend yourself out of debt and solve the economic problems by spending, to me, is just anathema. I, I, just, I just can't get it. And when I hear people say, well, you've spent $1.4 trillion more this year than you've taken in, but we can spend more and get out of debt, I think you've got to be smoking something that's illegal. You know, this is crazy. The, the, the health bill we're talking about is going to cost at least another trillion dollars over the next decade. It's going to raise taxes of probably God only knows how much. We're already $1.4 trillion in the tank right now. And there's going to be more spending. They want to come up with more programs that's going to cost money in taxes, like the cap and trade. You can't spend your way out of the hole. When you get so deep, you've got to stop digging. And that's the problem we have right now. I'm putting this in very simple economic terms. We need to cut spending. There's a book I wish you would read, Mr. Irons. It's called The Forgotten Man. Have you ever heard of that book? No, I haven't. Well, you being an intellectual, I wish you'd read it. It's a book that uh, goes uh, from 1929 to 1941, and it tracks the Roosevelt administration and the things that they did to solve their economic problems. And they did almost the same thing you're talking about in the mid-1930s. And you know what happened? Things got worse. And it wasn't until the war started that they dug themselves out of that hole because everybody had to go to back to work, women and everybody else, because they were fighting overseas. The only reason I bring all this up is, you know, I I've been here for 27 years, and some people say, well, that's too long. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I have to tell you this. One thing I do know is that you can't spend more than you take in. Inevitably, it's going to come back and bite you in the rear end. And that's where we're going right now. And this idea, and I heard you, I think I heard you say that we're in a position now where we could spend more money to get the economy moving and that sort of thing. I think, Mr. Irons, that you're incorrect. And uh, I hope you'll read that book. And maybe the next time I see you, you'll have a different uh, perspective on uh, the way we spend money in this country. And with that, Dick, it sure is good seeing you, buddy. I wish you were still here. <laughs> Thank you. And still majority leader, I would say. And still majority. Now, now, now you're going too far. You're dreaming. Stanley um, Hoyer, I'm sure Stanley uh, Hoyer would have uh, a different uh, view uh, of the uh, matter. <laughs> Let me uh, recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, both the gentlemen for being here. And uh, Dr. Irons, I didn't know when it became a bad thing to know, s know stuff. Uh, and I think Dr. Army would agree, uh, Mr. Army would agree that uh, uh, a little knowledge sometimes is a good thing, and having, uh, having the facts is a good thing. And I would point out that, uh, yes, in World War II, we pulled ourselves out of a recession. It was one of the greatest examples of big government investment, and the U.S. debt uh, was at extremely high levels during World War II. And that was, you know, I think most economists would tell you that uh, that had a big part of about pulling us out of, um, out of the recession and depression at, at that time. Mr. Army, uh, do you uh, do you support uh, unemployment compensation during times like this? Well, obviously, we we always like to help people who are truly distressed. There's always a question of what definition you give to that. And uh, again, like almost everything I can think of, even uh, unemployment compensation, which can be, in fact, a good and necessary thing, can be carried to extreme. If it right. becomes uh, a, a fountainhead for dependence. Uh, let, let me, just, just so we're on the same track, I understand where you're going. Let me, let me rephrase the question. Uh, do you agree that uh, for people who are out of work through no fault of their own and are continuing to look for a job in the economy and can't find one through no fault of their own, that they should receive unemployment compensation? I don't believe that the best public policy option is to make them less miserable in their continued unemployment for a longer period of time, as opposed to those that policies that can be directly pursued that will give them the job opportunity. One of the things that frustrates me as I look at this 
past year and a half in the United States with public policy is the opportunities to expand employment opportunities for real people in the private sector that have been foregone. Uh, and uh, the problem is office holders also always, uh, uh, oftentimes tend to pacify their own feelings of inadequacy by saying, well, at least we made them more comfortable in their misery. Let and me ask I don't you find this, that right, a very Mr. Attractive Army, would you have voted option? for the unemployment compensation packages uh, that were in the economic recovery bill and that have the House has passed since then? I can't remember. I'm sorry. Would we, I we, have? We passed, we passed, econ we passed unemployment I compensation. I probably would have. I, I, I may very reluctantly have voted for them while I argued we ought to be doing something more productive, more responsible, uh, with a greater heart and a greater okay. sense of dignity and future uh, for these folks. You would, have, way you, would have voted, you would have voted yes? I just want to make it clear. I don't know. I, I haven't looked at the package. Right. I didn't look at the package. I never voted on how, something I didn't how, read. How about, the, how about the tax uh, reduction components of the economic recovery bill? If there were any tax reduction components that were not merely income redistributional and I could possibly assess us to have, have something to engage savers and investors in more of that activity, which would re result in job creation, well, me, I would have been supportive Let me ask you this. You keep saying if there were. Did you read the economic recovery bill? No, I didn't. Did. I had no reason okay. to read it. I wasn't well, no, uh, no, going no, to I, vote Mr. on it. Mr. Mr. Army, you've been, you've been commenting an awful lot, both here and in the press, about the economic right. recovery bill. Uh, we ask members of Congress to read right. it when they vote on it and are considering right. it. You've, you've said a lot about it, right. so I, I'm a little surprised to learn that you haven't Well, look, read if, it, if but, my neighbor's but, got a dead cat stinking up his yard, I don't know, have to know how it got there to know it's a dead cat stinking up the yard. What's that? Well, I, I think it's <laughs> important to, to read things. I, I understand there's some comments suggesting that knowing stuff is a bad thing. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that we owe it to the people that we're communicating with that we, we have an understanding to read uh, the information. Let me, let, me, let me ask you this, because it's not clear yet whether you're for the unemployment compensation components uh, or whether you are, uh, would have supported the tax cut components. Both of those were significant components, by the way, of the economic recovery bill. Dr. Irons, can you talk to a little bit to, to that fact? The economic recovery bill that we've been talking about today uh, represents less than a third of uh, what was in there for economic uh, impact. Uh, could you comment a little bit on that, please? Yeah, that's right. The, the specific elements that have been uh, reported on through the recovery.gov recipient reports represent, uh, will represent about a third of the total amount that's in the package. Right now, they're about a quarter because they've gone out a little more slowly than the tax cuts, the assistance to the states, and some of the other components. Uh, so tax cuts are a significant part. The assistance for states is a significant part. And the direct investments, which largely show up, uh, in the reports we've been talking about today are a significant part, uh, about equal weight to each. So the numbers that we've seen today are only a part of the overall impact. Okay. Could you, could you comment a little bit on the situation that the President inherited with respect to the uh, deficit and debt uh, following the last uh, administration? Yeah, the, the deficit, which is now you know, well over a trillion dollars, is largely the result of policies that were put in place before the President took office, uh, as well as the deteriorating economy. Um, the economic deterioration, which was, as I said before, the most rapid since 1947, is the prime culprit in terms of the reduction in revenues and the increase in, in outlays uh, that have resulted um, from just the economy going down. That's been the prime driver of the higher deficit. And so in thinking about how you solve a deficit problem, the number one priority is to get the economy moving again. And that we can't solve the deficit problem if we have a recession that's going to last for five years or ten years. That needs to be the number one priority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Did you, did, did break yeah, one? The gentleman, you yield yeah, for just a moment. Seconds. Mr. Army, since you didn't have a chance to read that entire document, let me assure you that those of us who had a chance to read it, not in the few hours between the airdropping at midnight and the vote, but, but afterwards, no, there were no uh, non-redistribution uh, tax cuts, and the tax cuts that are in there were de minimis to uh, in the investor class in any way, shape, or form, unless you include the green jobs. I right. yield back and thank the gentleman. You know, I, um, uh, the I gentleman, you, it's I on the gentleman's fine. time. I must admit, yeah. But, I, Mr. I, Chairman, I, will I, give me I, plenty I, of I extra add if I need to, it's just you, know, you will definitely get it. But, you know, I just think uh, this is a little strange, though, um, knowing the kind of technical person that you were when you provided leadership here, that you provide leadership for an organization that's uh, totally against the bill and you haven't read it. But anyway, I, uh, that's another guy.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Irons, in one of your earlier statements, you said that uh, the recovery package, and I quote, was kind of try a little bit of everything. Is that right? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the exact wording, but it's yeah. It close. seems. I mean, it seems to me what what a mischaracterization. I mean. I would argue what this government has done, and frankly goes back to the previous administration as well, is not try a little bit of everything. We've tried a lot of one thing, big government spending. I mean, think about it. The bailout package last fall, the stimulus package, the, but, the appropriations process that, that has moved forward, we're spending at 12, 14 percent increases. I mean, all we've done, I've argued many times, a big spending was going to get us out of this mess. We should have been out of it a long time ago. That's all the government's been doing. So to characterize as we've tried a lot of everything or a little bit of everything is just, just totally, totally wrong. But here's where I want to focus with both of you guys. I want your response to this. Uh, thinking now in a, in, a, in a big picture sense, two questions. Are you troubled, either one of you, are you troubled by what I would characterize as an unprecedented involvement of the government in the private sector? And let's go specifically to, to all the spending we know, but how about this fact, which just, when I think about this, in the United States of America, we now have a federal government pay czar telling private American citizens how much money they can make. And I understand it's done in the, in the context of the TARP repayment plan, but think about that, what's going on in the, in the framework of Senator Schumer saying, maybe we need to look at the idea of, of uh, any publicly traded company Mr. Feinberg has jurisdiction over executives and their pay compensation. So are you troubled by where this administration seems to, seems to want to take this economy? And I'll start quickly with Mr. Army and then with uh, well, Mr. Well, first of all, yes, I'm troubled because uh, on our first basis, on the basis of individual liberty. Uh, those of us who believe in personal freedom, and especially freedom of enterprise, and we witnessed the world's uh, great success story through private individual enterprise, understand that when the government tries to manage, as they have tried in many other countries, they eventually get it wrong. Secondly, and, and more pragmatically, uh, there's a, an incentive effect. In fact, uh, you know, you can go all the way back to Shakespeare or you can jump forward to Thomas Alva Edison. Their point was it's not worth uh, writing, it's not worth inventing unless it can be sold for a profit. There is no greater, more productive motive in the history of the world that is, that is contributed to human well-being greater by greater amounts and done less to negatively affect human well-being than the profit motive. And if the government's going to, in fact, say, look, we will confiscate your salaries, your, your, your earnings, and so forth, you disincentivize people from being productive. Thank you. Dr. Irons, quickly. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not a quick answer, unfortunately. It's a big question. Um, the government is, be, is involved in a number of different the areas. The question was, are you troubled by the unprecedented level of government involvement in the private well, sector? Well, I think you have to be more specific than that. I mean, there are areas where the but government should be involved. But you can answer yes or no if you're troubled. Uh, I, I am not troubled by some, and I am troubled by others. Okay. Uh, I would much rather the government be out of the banking business, out of the car business. Um, I think that once you are in it at the behest of banks, in the case of TARP, you need to do what you have to do to manage that effectively, be it a pay czar, be it oversight, reasonable oversight over the business practices of assets that you own. I think that is reasonable. I would like the government to be out of the banking sector. Let me, let so me frame the question. Bits and pieces. Let me frame the question in a slightly different manner. Would you... Would you um, I would argue that one of the things holding us back from coming out of this recession with the type of job growth we'd all like to see is uh, business people are smart people. They take educated risks. They don't take crazy risks. And so they're asking themselves, you know, I'd like to bring those people back I laid off. I'd like to do that expansion that we were thinking about doing. But I don't know what these yahoos in Congress are going to do next. I don't know if they're going to pass this health care proposal, which raises my tax. I don't know if they're going to pass this cap and trade, which is going to cost me more in energy costs. Would you argue that the uncertainty and, uh, of the policies being promote, uh, promoted, policies being advanced, is hindering the ability to create jobs, whether they get done or not? Uh, and let's go quickly with Dr. Irons and then do uh, Dr. Army. Uh, I think uncertainty is not good for the private sector. Whether or not these are major uncertainties in the life of a business person, I don't, I don't think so. I think a lot of this is on your head. You can pass health care and remove that uncertainty. Uh, I think that and we can get rid of the uncertainty. We can add a big tax if we do it, right? Well, I, I think I think that certainty is better, and the more we can forecast what we're going to do, what you're going to do, I agree that that is a good way to go. Dr. Army, quickly. There's, there's no doubt about it. The uncertainty uh, kept the investor class on the sidelines throughout all of the 70s, uh, and uh, they're sitting it out right now. Uh, 
uh, and specifically with what they see as the targeted industries of the big government ambitions of this administration. Mr. Chairman, if I could, since you, you took a little bit of my, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Chairman, one last question on, on, on the debt. We're at 12 trillion. We're, sl we're slated to go to $20 trillion over the next decade. I mean, this, this, this scares me to death. I'm, I'm the guy who offered a balanced budget this, this past spring. I actually tried to cut some spending and get, get some sanity back in our government. Gen Think gentlemen. about what it takes to balance this, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Give me just 30 seconds. To balance this, we first have to get to zero. Then we got to run a trillion dollar surplus, I mean, to, to ever get to balance. So how serious, I mean, to me, this seems like the, the most serious thing, one of the most serious things facing our government, our country. How serious is it, uh, Dr. Irons? Uh, I think it's important to maintain a level of deficit and debt that is sustainable. Do we need to get exactly to zero? I don't think there's any economist who's going to say there's something magic about a zero balance. Um, I think if you feel it's important to keep your books in balance, that's one thing from an economic perspective. You can absolutely maintain permanent deficits, a permanent debt, so long as you maintain the sustainability of the loan. I understand. Jim. And now I'll call on the gentleman Thank you, Mr. From, Chairman. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you call on the gentleman from uh, Louisiana, Mr. Gao. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, um, Dr. Army, I was reading through some of your background, um, and it says here that um, when I was a professor, so I would assume that you taught uh, at a university level. And um, if you don't mind me asking, what was your salary teaching economics at the university? <laughs> well, I, I left teaching 1985 uh, or 84. I was teaching both summer terms, and I, my salary was uh, $35,000 at that time. And it was a, a curious case in my point. I was one of the few people I knew that was qualified by way of uh, a comparable employment uh, to actually leave my employment and go to Washington in Congress and double my salary. Very few, very, very few people could do that. Uh, college professors could. Uh, so the, the, the pay isn't always all that good. Uh, uh, but still, you know, somebody's going to pay you to do nothing but what you enjoy doing. It's not a bad well, life. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your answer. And the reason why I, uh, I asked the question was uh, previously I questioned uh, Deputy Secretary Miller on the amount of jobs created uh, in connection with the amount of money actually spent. Uh, according to the numbers that Mr. Miller presented, the Department of Education has spent $67 billion in order to create approximately 400,000 jobs. And based on the numbers uh, that he presented, uh, I calculated that per, on, on, on the average it would cost $167,500 to create one educational related job. And my question to you, uh, Dr. Army, is this. Based on the average salary that Mr. Miller stated as about $70,000 per educator, uh, which leaves about $100,000 remaining uh, to be spent on what have you. How, how can your or organization, uh, I, I see that you here, you are, you are in charge of Freedom Works. In what ways can the private sector or, or your organiz organization improve on the efficiency of jobs creation? Well, it's very hard to improve on the efficiency of the government because cost efficiency is no part of their incentive structure. Uh, so what happens when you, when you uh, when you devote yourself to uh, sustaining employment in the public sector, you also sustain a very high, costly, oftentimes not very productive uh, uh, superstructure, uh, a support structure. And of course, it's not a college professor I know of that isn't aware that the college spends too much time and money sustaining redundant administrative positions, all of which have to be supported in order to, to support the faculty. The private sector is much more efficient. That is to say, it costs less money to sustain a job, and because that job, more often than not, is of greater productivity, has a return to it, and they are incentivized to hold down overhead costs. Based on your experience uh, as an educator, as well as being um, a majority leader, um, in your uh, 
professional opinion, how would the Department of Education better uh, spend its um, stimulus money in order to create jobs? Well, again, it's very difficult for me to envision very many ways in which government can spend money and, and enhance production, output, growth in uh, total output, productivity. Governments are just frankly not very efficient in their use of people's money. And uh, so if in fact you, rather than taxing more money either for me or my grandchildren to put more money in the hands of, of government agencies and bureaucrats to spend inefficiently now for a very little gain in well-being for the community. Leave the money in my hands. I'll invest it wisely. We'll have capital expansion. You remember the, uh, uh, there was a great theory of uh, business cycles called the innovation cycle advanced by Joseph Schumpeter and I remember uh, John Kenneth Galbraith criticizing because we've seen it all, there'll never be another great invention. But look at uh, in, the, in the 80s when the investors got in class, all that invention, all that creativity of the 60s and the 70s and the electronic sector of the economy just burst on the scene. So now we have all kinds of careers, jobs, opportunities for further employment and enhancement in the private side in product lines that didn't even exist in 1980. Thank you, you about my time. I now yield to the gentleman, ranking member from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I could have the slide put up with the majority statement here. I have underlined a portion that says, on October 30, 2009, the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, Recovery Board, released a consolidated account of those reports showing the Recovery Act funds have directly created or saved 640,329 jobs. Uh, that has been disputed here today. Mr. Army, if I asked you to calculate what uh, uh, $1.73 billion would, uh, would promote in the way of jobs if you gave it to the government, would you be able to do it that accurately? Well, I would have to, first of all, I would have to brush up my shakes here. We will probably get in touch with the Department of Labor Statistics, one of the really reliably honest uh, agencies of the Federal Government. Uh, probably rely also a little bit on some of the information I could get well, from let the me, general let me ask you office. Let me ask you a, 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 a one that you don't have to brush up on, which goes to the core of your economics training and, and, and theory. Uh, if we accept those figures, even though the earlier panel said it is plus or minus a whole bunch, there is inaccuracies and so on, if we accept those figures, then if we took fiscal year 2010, Mr. Obama's fiscal year, where we are going to spend $3.552 billion, just call it $3.5 trillion, I am sorry, $3,552 billion, $3.5 trillion. And using the same ratio, my whiz kids in the back came up with 13,145,253 jobs. So if we continue at that rate, that means that the Federal Government which employs about 3 million people directly, can spend 13 million on Medicare, Medicaid, every social program, everything. We can save 13 million jobs with our current spending. And if we double the spending, we could nearly, nearly wipe out the 15 million unemployed. So is Dr. Irons and Dr. Army, but first Dr. Irons, is it logical to simply spend $3.5 trillion more dollars every year in order to get unemployment down? Or is, in fact, the Keynesian concept simply unsustainable, that government jobs are like feeding somebody a fish for a day, you spend the $3.5 trillion, you keep people on the government payola hanging around blue rooms waiting for something to do, and then at the end, and not eliminating any inefficiencies, and then at the end of the year, the $3.5 trillion spent, and you've got to spend it the next year if you want to keep those people off unemployment. Isn't that true, Dr. Irons? I think you are mixing apples and oranges to a great extent. With okay, Dr. Army, I, I understand you know about apples well, and oranges. I think what you have to first I go back to my initial observation. A very large portion of the existing expenditure and employment structure of the current Federal Government is redundant. So the fact of the matter, or even for that matter, counterproductive. So if you add to that, you just add to the burden. So and more, more course, rocks in a knapsack of somebody who can't carry a 100-pound pack is not going absolutely. to get it any better. Let me ask yeah. you about the hangover. Dr. Army, 
If we were to spend the $3.5 trillion additional dollars that those who say more government will take care of unemployment, don't we have an inevitable hangover where the debt burden, in other words, the amount of money that goes out just to pay the Chinese for what we owe them, in fact, mortgages the future of government decisions? In other words, it creates a permanent overhead that you can't get past even if you reduce the size of government? Well, we are uh, we're already there. If we were to meet our current obligations in Medicare uh, and Social Security, we would pretty well consume the existing current Federal budget. Again, the problem still remains. The government cannot get money unless they print it, unless they directly take it away from somebody else. People are not willing to to buy our notes and, right. and lend us well, money, Doc and Dr. we Army, burden our children with the taxes. Dr. Army, uh, obviously spending 167000 for each job, and it is only a job for one year, it is one year full-time equivalent, could be compared to the private sector. Can you imagine your wildest dreams, somebody saying, if you loan, if you give me 167000 all I can do is create one job for one year. Can you imagine an investor uh, being asked to do that? Wouldn't it typically be that if you invest, let's say, 1.6 uh, million, in other words, 10 times that figure, I will create 10 jobs in perpetuity? Isn't that the normal business model, something along that line of about 10 jobs per million that are permanently created in the private sector? Well, that's right, because the private sector produces a product that people want, and there's a productivity enhancement that, that generally comes from expanding your capital stock and applying new science and engineering. But there's repeat sales. The fact of the matter is uh, the government doesn't produce anything. Last, because my time has expired. The old axiom that if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, and if you teach him how to fish, he'll, f he'll feed his family for a lifetime. Isn't this stimulus simply fish for government employees for one year, even if you accept the figures given to us today? My own view is, again, we've, we start with an already uh, existing redundant sec uh, capacity in the Federal Government. So it is, in fact, it's, it's basically spending our money on their own operation, which uh, leads to no enhancement in the overall well-being, productivity, uh, productive capability of the economy. So that's like, you know, you're taking the... Uh, you're taking the groom's meals away to buy, uh, or the horse's oats away from him to buy more steak sandwiches for the groom. Yeah. So you just the gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Drehaus. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I wasn't here for the entire presentation. I was in another committee, but it seems as if we've gone from defining propaganda to engaging uh, in propaganda in, in some of what we're doing here. Uh, Dr. Irons, could, could you help us? Uh, do you believe that the, uh, the estimates, and, and we're only talking about a small portion of the stimulus uh, in terms of job creation, the estimates of 640,000 jobs, even if the statistics aren't exactly specific, do you believe they're close to being accurate? Yeah, I think they're ballpark. As I said in my testimony, uh, the errors have been brought up and the mistakes. There are some that would underestimate the number of jobs and some that overestimate. So as a ballpark matter, I think we're getting ballpark right numbers. Okay. Uh, and, and Mr. Army, um, I, I, I find the, the conversation that was just engaged in very curious. This, this notion that we're spending $167,000 per job and, and that job being a, a temporary thing. It, when you create a bridge, and, and you hire somebody to build a bridge, does the bridge have value in and of itself? I'm sorry, do what? When you build a bridge and hire someone to build that bridge, does the bridge have value? Well, assuming that the bridge is a bridge to somewhere, yes, it would. And of course, I mean, it's it would be the greatest in observation in economic development theory is uh, sound public capital increases the productivity of the private sector. And, and if you're building a bridge, it, Mr. Army, if you're building a bridge, I assume that the iron that's coming for that bridge uh, is coming from an, an iron factory. I'm, I'm assuming that the tools that are used to create the bridge, I, I'm assuming that the cranes coming to create the bridge are coming from the private sector. I, I also assume that the engineering studies and, and the architecture studies, those are private sector jobs, are they not? Well, it's certainly so. And, and so the one are you, are job that might be created to build the bridge or the multiple jobs that might be used to, right. to build the bridge are actually having a, a ripple effect in the economy in that the private sector is benefiting tr quite s tremendously, just using this scenario, 
in that the, the supplies for the bridge are coming from the private sector, the, the tools being used to build the bridge are coming from the private sector, the engineering studies are coming from the private sector, the architecture studies right. are coming from the private So, So is it a misrepresentation? That, that the gentleman has made that one job that costs $167,000, that it's really only that one job and that it's only temporary. First of all, you have to be very careful when you recognize if in order to get the money to build the bridge, you take it away from me. I might have bought something and there would have been the same uh, Do you have the capacity to build a bridge? Do you have the capacity to build a bridge for a tax cut? Look, uh, if in fact there were any substantial documented portion of these funds that were going to real public capital uh, expenditures, I would be more encouraged by your argument. Well, there absolutely are. And, and I would point you to, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting that you bring this up, because the minority leader has suggested, and he's from the state of Ohio, that there had been no projects that were capital in nature invested in the state of Ohio. And then the next day, the, the governor's office and, and the Department of Transportation in the state of Ohio said, in fact, while we engage in this hyperbole all the time about no infrastructure dollars going in, they laid out a whole series of projects that have been invested in, in infrastructure in the state of Ohio. So are those job creation efforts? If, in fact, they build real productive public capital. You can go back to uh, Adam Smith. Yes, this is good uh, investment in the So it's creating community. jobs. But I would argue that in this last, and frankly, the, uh, President Bush's as well, uh, there was very little expenditure of these big expansive funds uh, uh, allocated to real public capital structure, mostly to income redistributional uh, efforts like, uh, like tax rebates and things of this nature. So I guess in the memorable line of Shania Twain, I'd have to say that don't impress me much. Well, I would like to get back to, to, to this notion that these are, are one-year jobs. Um, are, are you familiar with, uh, you know, in the construction sector, jobs that continue ad infinitum? If you do a road project, if you build a house, uh, if you build a hotel, if you build a building in, in downtown Cincinnati, if you build a bridge, uh, do, those, do those jobs go on forever? Or, or do, does it go project to project to project? And isn't the idea in, in investing in, in a project, in, in fact, to create that temporary employment to get them over that time when, when the economy is slow. Well, of course, if you're talking about capital investment, you build your plant, you build your road, you build your bridge, and then on that, you have in, uh, ongoing produ production and, and productivity and expanding in the economy, if sure. it is a real capital structure. Like I said, there's a big difference in whether or not it's a bridge to somewhere as opposed to a bridge to nowhere. If it's a bridge to nowhere, then uh, there are no future employment opportunities that are pursuant to the bridge. Well, I wasn't in the Congress when they were building bridges to nowhere. Uh, I, I'm just I'm just in the Congress when when we're putting money in, into bridges and and bridges that matter in, in Cincinnati and elsewhere. But this notion that these jobs, you know, because they they employ someone for a year and and that's how they're counted, somehow don't count because a construction project apparently is supposed to last for years and years and years and years. Well, uh, I just don't understand that. And if you could help me with that, well, I'd appreciate it. Well, right. there's a substantial difference in spending the money to build a bridge that enhances the, uh, the production of the community, the movement of goods and services, or a plant or a facility, as opposed to paying uh, for another year's salary for a redundant person on a faculty someplace. And Gentlemen. in fact, if you're Gentlemen. doing make work, and this was a, an argument that Gaines himself engaged in. Keynes argued that you could actually improve well-being by just having people dig holes and fill them back but, in. But I'm, I'm curious as to your, your Chairman, I would ask time. unanimous consent that gentlemen have more time to talk about this very small portion of the bill, having very little to do about the earlier discussion. But I, as he wants to go on about the small amount of roads, even though there should have been a large amount of roads, <laughs> I'd ask you have another 30 I, I, seconds. I would just, I would just ask the, the witness one more time. You, you mentioned a redundant faculty member. Um, is it your belief that that the teachers that are being supported through this legislation are redundant faculty members? Let me, let me say very clearly about this. I was a professor for 20 years. I'm intimately familiar with what goes on in universities and educational facilities. And they are extremely inefficient at internal resource allocation. And yes, there are many, many redundant faculty uh, members. Now, the heartbreak of that 
is where you could expand the faculty members where there's a truly need, you are often blocked from doing so while you maintain the employability of the redundancy. So, so your experience so, as a university professor at a university allows you to suggest that the faculty members that are retaining employment through this legislation in K through 12 education across the country are redundant? Let me suggest you yeah. that, first you know, of all. I, I, I'm trying to be uh, generous. I'm trying hard, <laughs> you know, but the gentleman's time has long expired. <laughs> and if he has any additional questions, may you put them in writing and then have the uh, Dr. Army to respond I, to them. Okay? I appreciate the chairman's indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. I may have just conclude by pointing out, I believe my 20 years of experience in the university and in the administration of universities is a greater degree of experience than yours in building bridges. Well, you know, <laughs> well let me just say, that first of all, let me thank both witnesses you know, for your testimony. And I think that, uh, of course, um, um, you've been very, very helpful. And I think Dr. Irons has pointed out that even though that a few mistakes were made, that when you look at the overall picture, that it probably balances out because some information did not go forward. So we really, you know, uh, when you look at the overall picture, it will balance out in terms of the actual amount of jobs that was created. The testimony we have heard today directly refutes the completely unsupported allegation of propaganda. It's not propaganda. Most of the witnesses agree that Recovery Act spending has created and saved hundreds of thousands of jobs. The 640,000 jobs that were reported as directly created or saved by just a portion of initial recovery spending validates estimates by the government and private forecasters that the Recovery Act is responsible for more than one million overall jobs so far. And of course, uh, that to me, uh, which includes jobs indirectly and created and jobs saved and uh, all these different categories that people are talking about here. The stimulus package put forward to help everyday working Americans is a far cry from propaganda. This is putting food on, on, on the table of many families. To the real people whose jobs were saved and to those who have found work, it represents food on the table and a roof over their heads. The real issue is that we need to get Recovery Act projects underway faster and we need to target them on economically distressed areas, the areas that really need it most, we need to make certain that we put it in there and make certain that jobs are created. Uh, at the same time, we need to continue our strict oversight of Recovery Act spending. The chairman of the Recovery Board testified that the Recovery Act contains the most extensive accountability and transparency provision that we have ever seen. We, we intend to ensure that we make the most of them. Finally, I understand that politics is involved in everything we do up here on Capitol Hill. I understand that. I've been here 27 years. But the issue of job creation is too important to play politics with. And I refuse to play politics with it. We need to work together to get this economy back on its feet and get, them, get people back to work. Uh, this is serious, and I think that if we work together, we can do that. We need to make certain that we have some penalties involved with agencies and groups that are not reporting. We need to make certain that we get the legislation through that makes it possible for people to have funding. Uh, I think that it, now it's an unfunded mandate, and I think that we really should make certain that they're able to get accountants, that they're able to get administrative people, they're able to get folks in that will be in, in a position to get information into at, at, at a reasonable period of time and making certain that that information is accurate. And I think that uh, um, it makes it very, it's very important to do that. I think to ignore it and to just talk about, you know, this is not working and that's not working, and at the same time, people are suffering. And we cannot afford that luxury any longer. We have a job to do, and we need to do it. So I want to thank you, Dr. Army. I want to thank you, Dr. Irons. And Dr. Army, it's good to know that there's life after this place. Thank you very much. And on that note, I yield back, and the committee is now adjourned. <laughs>